Welcome to the Culture Lab. I'm your host, Aga Bayer. This podcast helps you turn your company culture into rocket fuel for meaningful growth. It explores how we can make the word work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. It looks at how we can build remarkable cultures that scale as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. Hello, and welcome to episode 93 of the Culture Lab podcast. This episode is brought to you by Culture Brain, a one of a kind global community for leaders and culture champions who want to learn new ways of cultivating remarkable cultures at scale in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. The Culture Brain community is where we come together to answer some pretty darn hard ungoogleable questions about culture. And our members get to participate in things like weekly huddles, masterclasses, flash mastermind groups, and talks from world-class experts on culture. And you know many of these experts from this podcast. But most importantly, we facilitate deep peer-to-peer connections. Because making work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging It's definitely not a task for a single person. It requires tapping into the collective wisdom of bold, kind, and curious culture leaders who are on a mission to redefine and, frankly, decrapify work. So if this sounds like something you'd like to be a part of, check it out at tiny.one forward slash culturebrained. And don't worry, you don't have to write it down. There is a link in the show notes. You might have noticed that the quality of sound is slightly different this time. And it's because I'm at a workation in a beautiful place called Messenia in Greece, and my mic started playing up. So until we replace it, you will have to bear with me. So thank you for your patience. So today my guest is Wendy Smith, a professor of management at the Alfred Lerner College of Business and Economics. Wendy's research focuses on strategic paradoxes, how leaders and teams effectively respond to contradictory agendas. And it's her second time round on the show because she has a new book coming out and I was really keen to learn what's new in her thinking. If you've ever felt pulled in two seemingly opposite directions or if you've ever faced a dilemma, you will probably find a lot of what we talk about familiar. And I hope that the ideas that Wendy and I discuss will be helpful in how you navigate competing demands. What Wendy discovered in her work is really fascinating. She found that two competing demands can both be something that's important and they can actually inform one another. So we don't have to choose between two options. And I can't help but think how true and how relevant that is when it comes to two fundamental tensions in all company cultures, the one between results and relationships, and the second one between risks and between roles. Making trade-offs in these competing demands would lead to one of the deadly sins of company culture, toxicity, mediocrity, bureaucracy, or anarchy. If you prioritize results over relationships, you will end up with toxicity. If you go the other way, you will end up with mediocrity. If you choose rules with no risks, you will get paralyzing bureaucracy. But if you choose only risks with no rules, you will end up with anarchy. So in this episode, Wendy talks about the importance of balancing the competing demands at work rather than seeing them as two options we need to choose from. So I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. With no further ado, here is Wendy Smith. I am Wendy Smith, and I am thrilled to be here. I am a professor, which means that I get to research ideas, generate ideas, and be able to translate and share ideas to have some hopeful impact on the world. Welcome back, Wendy. And I'm so thrilled to have you on the show again. So I think the first time round, your interview was released as episode 25, if I recall correctly. And now it's going to be 100 something. So it's been a while and things have changed since the last time we've spoken, I'm sure. 
first of all, we've had a global pandemic. I personally moved to a new country. I started a new venture. And you have a new book coming out really soon. It's called Both and Thinking, Embracing Creative Tensions to Solve Your Toughest Problems. And you co-authored it with Marianne Lewis. So congratulations first. Thank you so much. It's been a labor of love to bring these ideas to a different audience and a broader audience beyond the academic audience. I completely get it because writing a book was one of the hardest things I think that I have ever accomplished. So unless it's a labor of love, I think it's just impossible to do it. And I also know how passionate you are about the work that you are doing. So I'm very excited about this book. I'm very excited about this book, Reaching People, because I think it's hugely needed, especially today. So very keen to talk about this. And I think a good place to kick our conversation off is just, you know, out of curiosity, I know that you've spent a huge part of your career researching paradox. And so I'm curious, what was the first paradox or dilemma that you faced in your life, if you can recall, maybe early on in your life, that made you go, hmm, I wonder, can I have both? I had a professor when I was uh, doing my PhD, Richard Hackman, and he would talk about how we only really understand the ideas that we come to by looking at them uh, retrospectively, doing some retrospective sense making. And since I have been studying paradoxes, I have really looked back to say, where have these shown up and why have I been interested in them? And there's been so many places in my own world that I have experienced these kind of opposite contradictory tensions that both create demands on my life, on our lives and trying to navigate them. And in the first show that we did together, I talked about what it was like to be a third child kid being amidst two different cultures. I think that I've also experienced these before I went back for my PhD, I was doing some management consulting and I was thinking a lot about what now we've talked about as social responsibility, but then was really a more novel concept about how Fortune 500 companies, large companies can manage a social mission along with its profit, along with their profit motive. And there was tremendous pushback from my consulting colleagues about whether that was even a possibility or whether as Milton Friedman said years ago, the social responsibility of a corporation is to its shareholders and the profit really should be king. And so this really grabbed my attention about what would it be like to effectively live between the social and the financial. And that was one of the places in which I was really challenged by this question of what it's like to navigate competing demands and have them both be something that's important and inform one another rather than having to think of them as trade-offs. Yeah, I love that. And I can totally see why that would really trigger your curiosity because there's really the sense that, oh my gosh, there must be a better way. It can't be just about choosing one of the options and either or. I'm curious now if you rewind uh, before your professional career and meeting Richard Hackman and being a student, was there a time in your life, retrospectively perhaps, when you had that sense? Like I personally remember moments in my life when I felt torn between two options or two different aspects of a situation and hoping that there would be a better way. Can you recall a situation from your personal life before academia where you had that sense, oh my gosh, there must be a better way? I think it happened for me in so many different places. When I was in high school, I was in a youth group and I had the opportunity and was eventually elected to be the international president of that youth group. And I had to make the decision about whether I would delay college for a year and spend the year with this organization or not. Uh, I then had a similar decision as soon as I finished my undergraduate degree. Would I go straight into a job in consulting that I had been offered or do I want to take some time and delay that job, which I ended up doing and ended up choosing to, uh, in fact, say no to the job and spend an extra year traveling and living abroad? And at the time, those trade-offs felt like I was giving up on something big in order to do something else. And in retrospect, as I think about those decisions, 
each one has informed my next step in a more profound way. So by spending the year with this youth group, I learned new things about myself. I learned new things about leadership. It really has a very straight through line to the work that I do today and to inform my career more profoundly. And the same is true for the decision to spend the year living abroad before I went back to work and went back to my PhD. And in each of those cases, what felt like a trade-off at the moment was really making a decision in the moment to think about a broader and bigger question of how do I want to live my life and what are my values and how do I achieve both passion and effectiveness and achieve both things that are important to me and be able to make an impact on others. And it's really, again, in this broader perspective that I see how the both and played out in those moments. This is so interesting. So would you say that zooming out of a dilemma that we are facing and really trying to think what is behind these decisions? Is this the first step that we should be taking when we want to really handle decisions and and paradoxes or dilemmas more effectively in life? Because it sounds like that's what you did in retrospect. So basically you thought, well, actually the decisions that I have taken have helped me to live that kind of life that I wanted to live. Yes. And I think there's two big ideas in what you've just said. So I want to take a minute, maybe unpack both of them. The first is that one of the things that we find that we understand and that we talk about in the book is this idea that paradoxes lurk beneath each of our dilemmas. And, And here's what we mean by that. We confront tensions, conflicting ideas at this tug of war as a dilemma in the moment that feels like it needs to have a decision made. So do I take the year off as this international president or do I go straight to college or do I go straight to consulting or do I take the time? That's how a dilemma feels to us. We need to make a decision. And there is urgency often to these decisions. It often feels like I need to take this decision now, right? So we don't even have necessarily the time to say, okay, let me see how that's going to play out because often you really do have to take a decision in a moment. Right. And for your listeners, you know, in their organizations, it might be right now, one of the big challenges that people are navigating is work from home and hybrid work. So what policy do I put in place around that? That feels like a real decision that I have to make and and something in the moment. We do, we have to make those decisions. And what we argue is that before coming to a solution on those decisions, and I'm using the word solution sort of broadly and saying, Let's move beyond the either or thinking and let's start by looking under the hood of those decisions, looking within those decisions and identifying the paradoxical tensions that reside there, because by doing so, we can come to better decisions. So if it's the work from home decision and the hybridity decision and and creating policy around that, underneath that decision is real tensions, ongoing, persistent, interdependent contradictions between things like what do we do that's best for the organization and what do we do that's best for the individual? And what we know is that doing things that's best for the individual sometimes feels like it could be in conflict with what we do that's best for the organization. And it's also the case that the more we attend as an organization to individual needs and people feel like they belong and they feel like they're comfortable and they feel like they're engaged, the more effectively they will be there to address organizational needs. And the more effective the organization is, the more that it can attend to the individual. And so we see the interplay between these. But first, we have to look at these underlying paradoxes, individual and collective, self and other, uh, flexibility and being able to have some agility and change while at the same time having some real stable, clear boundaries around things. That's certainly one of the paradoxes of work from home. What are the boundaries and rules that we're going to put in place and where and how are we going to enable flexibility and change and nuance. So surfacing those paradoxes enables us to think more deeply about the decisions that we make. I love that. And actually, there are many tensions that people who work in the area of company culture face on a daily basis. So just to throw a few more into the mix, I hear a lot, for example, do we focus on culture fit or culture ads? or employees first or customer first. 
or innovation or change and stability and the safety of what we are already doing really well. Or a conversation that I hear a lot is self-management and autonomous teams or hierarchy, which is best for us. So there's a lot really that's happening in, in the space of culture as well when it comes to these tensions. And so what you're saying is we really need to look at the paradoxes that are beneath these tensions. So I feel like maybe we need to unpack and define these terms first to help us understand the concept better. So what is a paradox? What is a tension? What is a dilemma? How are they different? And how would it be helpful for us to think about them? We use the word tension to be the overarching term of the conflicting and competing experiences that we have, these tug of wars. And an important idea here is that these tug of wars are not necessarily bad. We often experience them as difficult and challenging, and they can be enabling. They can introduce to us, depending on how we navigate them, we can find creativity by experiencing these tensions. And so a key idea here, and one thing that we have learned from our interviews and our research is that the more that people can surface tensions, the more that they invite the potential opportunity for creativity. We had a leader of a Fortune 500 company who would tell us, if people aren't putting tensions on the table, then we're not really getting to the deeper possibilities that we want for creative thinking. So I asked them for it. So, you know, one of the things that your listeners might take away here is if people aren't putting tensions on the table, ask for them. Where are they? Because they exist. So tension is that overarching term. I love it. I love it. You know, sometimes I say that the best sign of a healthy culture is not the superficial harmony and niceness and agreement, but it's actually the ability to grapple with some of these tensions and in having some intellectual friction happening. And this is how you know that you have a healthy culture. So it sort of aligns with what you have just shared with us about putting these tensions on the table. And if they're not there, really trying to elicit them from the team, because if we're not talking about them, it doesn't mean that they don't exist. Uh, I'm assuming it just means that something is not being addressed. Yes. And that there's possibility in doing that. I think in our last conversation, I had said to you, one of my favorite thinkers was Mary Parker Follett, who I still absolutely love. And she was sort of a forebearer of much of the conflict and negotiation theory that we have today. And she has this beautiful metaphor that friction, tension is indeed this, this source of creativity. She talks about, for example, that music, if you're playing a violin, the music emerges because of the tension between the bow and the strings, or that we only are able to drive a car because of the friction that happens between the tires and the road. So if people are more metaphor driven, they can think about what's the friction that's going to generate the beautiful music or enable us to move forward on the road. Yes, I love it. And you know, what came up for me is a conversation that I had on the show with Seth Godin. And he mentioned friction as well. And he used this beautiful metaphor of him with his dog on a lake that was frozen over during the winter. And he thought it would be such a great idea to take my dog there. He's just going to have so much fun. But actually, the dog didn't have fun at all because... <laughs> He was just <laughs> unable to run. It, the friction was not there. And so he hated it. And so I think that our relationship with tension is not entirely healthy because we avoid it. And as you say, we often don't see the opportunity that is hidden there if we're willing to experience it. And I totally can see how this leads to creativity and innovation. So we talked about tension. Is there a difference between tension and a dilemma? How would you address that? So we think of a dilemma. And by the way, when I say we, I am talking on behalf of myself and my co-author, Marianne Lewis, who I've been doing this research with for 20, 25 years. But we think of a dilemma as that pressing choice in the moment. Do I focus on my work right now or do I go home and have family dinner? Do I take this new job that's being offered to me or stay with my existing job. It's, it's the framing of the specific experience of 
the challenge that is demanding a choice on us. And it feels like a trade-off and it feels like we need to make that choice. And it often feels like an either or. That's the dilemma. Paradox then is what we understand to be these persistent, interdependent contradictions. So just to unpack that a minute, it's these opposing ideas, A or B, self or other, love or hate, today or tomorrow, stability or change that inform those dilemmas and that lurk within that are defining of the dilemmas that we experience. And what we are inviting people to do is to engage at the level of those paradoxes. One of the things that we spent some time with as we brought these ideas together in the book is really thinking about the origins of paradox. We think that we stand on the shoulders of giants, both people who have been talking about this in the field of organizations before us. But more profoundly, these ideas are ideas from 2,500 years ago of philosophers across the world who barely had conversations with each other. And we, we see these ideas in Greek philosophy with people like Heraclitus, who talked about no person stands in the same river twice because the river is always changing, the person is always changing. There's this duality between that notion of stability and change. You know, we also see it in the writings of Eastern philosophers, Confucius, Lao Tzu. I have colleagues who've been writing about this in African theory. Like the notion that our world rests on these interdependent opposites, ebbs and flows, yin yangs, really has informed the way people have been thinking for millennia. And I think it's only now that we're starting to think about how can we understand that concept in our personal lives and in our organizational lives and use it more profoundly to more effectively engage and more effectively lead. Yeah, I think it's a perfect segue to looking at how can we, because this is definitely an area that I know a lot of our listeners are interested in, and especially in the context of cultivating a great culture. How can our listeners cultivate this both and culture in their teams? Because I feel like there is a huge benefit and a huge opportunity if you can do that well. But I'm sure that for many people who are listening, it's not entirely clear how we can do that. There's several levels in which to think about this question. And I want to just, at the most broad level, note that one of the things about culture change, and Aga, you're probably one of the experts on being able to recognize this, is that leaders, as they think about culture, have two big levers. One is helping change individual minds and hearts, and the other is about changing systemic components in the system that you're building. And And so I want to just note there, there's a paradoxical tension right there in that between the individual and the system, between shifting hearts and minds and shifting the structures. Because on one hand, sometimes those things are in conflict with each other. People might think very differently than your system. Your system might impose something on the individuals. And yet individuals create the systems, individuals enable the systems. And so there's something reinforcing there. So I I want to just say that leaders have these two levers, both helping change hearts and minds and helping change structures and systems along the way. So I want to start there. Yeah, I think it's a really, really important differentiation. So just for those of our listeners who would like to hear a little bit more about what we mean when we talk about systems and structures in an organization, can you give us a few examples of systems, structures, or processes that might have an impact on a team culture or company culture? A leader, for example, sets policies, they set rules. I think of the vision and goals of the organization or of the team as a clear structure. It kind of creates the boundaries. It creates the scaffolding of how people think about the ways in which they behave in the team, their individual behavior. I think about culture as a way of integrating multiple components of a system so that it informs and how people behave, right? It's the unspoken rules of the team. It's the ways in which we do things around here that informs our individual behaviors. And for example, we talk about several key components that will enable the people in the system to embrace paradox. And one of those is, do we create an overarching vision, what we talk about as a higher purpose that embeds competing demands? 
For example, in one of the organizations that I studied early on, and this was at IBM, the leader of one of the strategic business units had a very clear higher purpose for the organization that was incredibly motivating and that encapsulated both. At that time, they were trying to innovate in the cloud-based space. She was trying to convey to her team how important it was to continue to service their existing customers and to radically shift with new innovation that might cannibalize those existing customers. And she really stated this overarching vision about their goals, about the impact that they were going to have on the world, reminded people of this vision and reminded people that they needed to bring along their existing customers into the innovation and use the innovation to surface and and enable the existing world, that both of these needed to happen simultaneously. That kind of overarching vision is one of the structures that scaffolds our paradoxical thinking in organizations. Yeah, thank you for sharing this example. And it really is so powerful. I see this in many organizations when it's done well, what incredible impact it can have and also how sometimes the lack of that clarity leads to major conflicts that I think really stand in the way of an organization's progress. An example that comes to mind is a company that we've recently worked with that genuinely has the intention of putting the employees first and making sure that people have the right work-life balance and are able to participate in their families' lives, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, there is a lot of pressure to bring results, particularly because there is a new investor on the horizon. And so the pressure to grow faster and be more profitable is much higher. And what happens as a result is that basically that tension between focusing on our employees and focusing on results, clarity hasn't been there. And therefore, Basically, everything tilted towards let's just win more business. And as a result, people are getting burnt out. And obviously, the organization is not getting the result that it was expecting to. And so I wonder, Wendy, how would you address that? So how would you attack a problem like that, both through creating this overarching vision and clarity, but potentially also some other steps to make sure that you can really address both of these elements and help them to support each other. Yeah, so when it comes to the the scaffolding and building the system that your leaders have the potential to do, there's two other steps, right? And I think what you're pointing out, I just want to say this back to you because I think it's important, is that you can't just put out a vision but then not act on that vision. It becomes uh, really demeaning to people. So the two other steps, we talk about it as separating and connecting, and building guardrails. And by separating and connecting, the important idea here is being able to identify the competing demands, pull them apart, understand what's important and valuable about each one, and then figuring out how they inform and define each other. And so if it's the tension between focusing on employees and focusing on results, it is the case that sometimes you're going to focus on employees and sometimes you're going to focus on results. But you have to make sure that you are keeping those in check with one another. And so separating means, okay, what's important about focusing on employees? How do we implement that? What's critical here? What's important about focusing on results? How do we implement that? That's the separating part. But then you can't just choose one and leave the other behind. Then you have to ask, how are they connected to one another so that we focus our employees in service of enabling results and that our results enable us to create the possibilities, the resources and the energy to better focus on employees and think about the relationship between the two of those. And, and I'll just say one more quick thing here. So that's the practices of separating and connecting. The other thing we find is the importance of building guardrails or what we call guardrails, which are these structures that make sure you don't go too far in one direction or another. And guardrails could be that you have people in positions who are uh, attending to these different demands, that you have uh, some rules or some policies in place around it, so that you don't go too far in either direction. It's the images, the guardrails on a road that keep you from veering off the road. Because 
one of the problems with navigating paradoxes is that indeed you say you're going to do two things and then you become so committed to one of them that you lose sight of the other. And so you can build in people and policies and visions and goals and metrics that keep you in this bounded space to hold you within these two competing demands. So you don't become so results focused that you say you're going to focus on employees, but don't do that. I love this idea of building guardrails. And I'm really curious if we can make it even more specific for our listeners, maybe by sharing a few examples of the organizations that you've worked with, where you've gone through this process of separating and then connecting. And finally, what were the guardrails that kept them within the right boundaries so that they can accomplish their vision, bring their vision to life? This is indeed a leadership challenge and leadership opportunity. I think I shared this with you last time, but one of the organizations where we saw this most powerfully was in a social enterprise digital divide data. I think you had Jeremy Hockenstein on your show. I did. Yes. They were fantastic. Yeah. And social enterprises are, I mean, it's just magnified in these organizations because they are committed to a social mission through a business purpose and really have the commitment to both of these. And yet most social enterprises fail because they either become so committed to the social mission that they don't make money or they become enthralled by the money they're making that they lose the social mission. And so guardrails at Digital Divide Data looked like having people in leadership positions who attended to, whose metrics were really focused on, are we hitting our social mission? Are we achieving our financial performance? Now, the important thing here is that at the leadership meetings, at the board meetings, Jeremy and his board, when one of the people said, hey, by the way, guys, you know, you've got a great mission here, but you're not going to succeed for another three months because you're falling apart financially. They listened to that, that the leaders heard that and listened to that. Uh, We have a colleague who did some research in hospitals who were looking at this power struggle between physicians uh, in hospitals who were trying to attend to the physical needs of a patient and the social workers in hospitals who were trying to attend to the mental and social needs of a patient. And wellness depends on both, but the physicians always had more power. And in order for them to be able to attend to a more holistic approach, they had to surface and raise up the power of the social workers and the mental health workers and make sure that at meetings when those people spoke, other people listened, and that they took that into account in attending to their patients. Well, that was a real challenge in making sure that the physicians were listening and that the leaders were empowering the people who had less of a voice to make sure that that voice was heard. When did you find that being explicit about this effort to focus on both? and make sure that both work. Do you think that it's helpful in terms of communication in your organization? So like, for example, with the organization that I've mentioned, would you advise them to actually be open about it and say, we are looking for ways to reconcile our needs to be people first and take care of our employees and this intention that is clearly there with our needs to grow be profitable and make our business successful. Yes. And I think that there's two points to that. One is to recognize the tension. And then the other is to, again, go back to saying how embedding those tensions allows you to get to your higher purpose, your impact, so that you understand that it's not just tension for tension's sake. You know, one of the organizations that I recently worked with was a large finance firm in Asia, and they had been a culture that was very much they were, they were very nice to one another. It was very human-oriented, human-centric. And they realized that in order to be competitive in the world, they also had to hold to some accountability that they weren't doing because they were so nice to each other. They had to introduce a digital perspective along with the human perspective. And people were so afraid of the change uh, because it felt like it was shifting up the organization so dramatically. And the leader was really clear that they were doing these new approaches, not in conflict with or not in stead of the ways that they had already been their existing values, but in addition to, and that they had to bring them together 
and use the language of these are our value pairs. These are our polarities. These are our paradoxes. And we're going to live in those paradoxes because in order to continue on for the next hundred years, we need to both change and we need to honor the things that we've done well. And that was very much part of their language. Yeah, I can only imagine that it's incredibly helpful. I have seen a few organizations myself who do it well and have seen that it has had a positive impact and really enables, gives people the language and enables, I think, a deeper conversation about what needs to happen. Thanks for sharing that. Wendy, I think that to wrap up that part of our conversation before we go to the rapid fire questions, I'd like to give you an opportunity to share anything that you believe would be really important and useful for our listeners to know about both and thinking so that they can help their teams be more successful, something that we haven't covered yet. I think it's important to note that this is not easy. You know, as we've been talking more and more about both and, one of the reactions that we're getting is, well, isn't this obvious? Well, it might be obvious, but it's not easy to implement. So even though people use language of we've got to live in the both and sometimes, really doing it is emotional. It sort of tugs at our anxieties. It's hard. It creates discomfort to live in competing ideas, especially if those competing ideas are across different groups. So if I have a different idea than you have and I want to prove that I'm right. So it's emotionally challenging. And I I think that I I want to say that because if leaders are going to invite their people to live in this both and there has to be a, a level of compassion and acknowledgement that it's not easy to do. We we say uh, that you have to be able to be comfortable in the discomfort, find comfort in the discomfort. And that is, again, a leadership opportunity for people to notice that for their employees. And, and I think to, to speak that out loud so that their employees aren't feeling frustrated and then lonely in their frustration, but that there is a collective sense that we are working on this together. And the reason we're committed to this is because it enables us to be a better company, to come up with better solutions, to have a bigger impact on some of our world's greatest problems. Uh, that's why we're living in this challenge together. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for mentioning this word committed, because I think it's it's actually really, really important. And it kind of reminds me of a conversation I had with Tom Chi, who was a guest on the podcast. He's one of the co-founders of Google X, the part of Google that basically focuses on future projects like Google Glass, self-driving cars and stuff like that. And he uh, introduced me to this interesting differentiation between attachment and commitment. And I think it's very relevant to our conversation and highlights the importance of having a clear vision of what we're trying to achieve here. Because attachment is basically arriving at a solution that might be one of those pieces, either or, I'm for this and against that and sticking to it. And it's very emotional, as you say, and we are convinced that this is the right solution. And so commitment is all about, I want to see this vision uh, being brought to life. And so if a solution that I come up with is not hitting the mark, I'm completely open and willing to explore other options and see what else is possible. And he says, you know, the feeling that we have around attachment and commitment is very similar. That's why sometimes it's so hard for us because in both cases, it feels like I care about this. I'm really passionate about this. But as he says, attachment is intrinsically inflexible and it really doesn't help us to solve problems in a sustainable way. And commitment is intrinsically flexible. And so it gives us way more freedom. And I think this is the spirit and this is the essence of both and thinking as well. You know, I'm going to take that idea away. I love that idea and I'm going to hold that. Uh, One of the things that we talk about is why either or thinking. We say it's limited at best and detrimental at worst. And one of the reasons is, is the language that you're using around attachment, which is that psychologically people really want to make a decision and then we want to be committed to and consistent with our decision. And that's great for the short term. And as you're pointing out, 
What it leads to in the long term is that you get stuck so that when the situation changes or that when you need a different solution, you're not agile and able to make that change. And we talk about that as a vicious cycle where that part of the vicious cycle is going down a rabbit hole. You are intensifying, reinforcing your point of view, even if it no longer fits the situation. And one of the reasons that that's problematic is because what happens then in the second part of this vicious cycle is that when things change and it's so detrimental, instead of finding a solution where you can kind of be more nuanced, people often will switch dramatically to the opposite side to to overcorrect. And so if we think about your example earlier between a culture that's employee centric or a culture that's result centric, and we go so far to result centric that we forget about the employees, instead of finding a nuanced both and of employee focused and results focused, many of those organizations will switch so dramatically to employee centric that they lose sight of the results. And so that pattern is is what we talk about as overcorrecting. And you don't want to be in this space where you're constantly moving back and forth between the two because it's like a wrecking ball. You wreck all the good with all, you know, with all of the things you don't want. The idea of both and is moving beyond those vicious cycles so that you can live in this more nuanced experience of both of these ideas at the same time. I'm smiling as you were describing that because I, at some point, was coaching a CEO who had identified that's probably his um, monopolizing conversations in his team and, and taking too many decisions himself. And as a result, he decided he needs to listen more and he really needs to draw ideas out of his team and, and maybe step back from taking some of the decisions himself. And then I had a conversation after a couple of months, I think, with some of his team members and they said, oh my gosh, you know, we've seen such a huge change. And actually, it's very confusing because he's like not contributing at all. And we need this. We need his direction from time to time. We need him to express his opinion from time to time. And we're kind of feeling lost. So it's also, you know, such a great example of someone who has overcorrected at some point, again, with the best intentions, but again, falling into that trap of either or. It falls into that adage, you don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And we use this image of a tightrope walker because in both and thinking, you have to make these choices over time. It's not always this ideal win-win that you find the ideal, integrative, perfect hybrid solution, but sometimes you have to make choices. But the choices are these micro shifts between employees and results or the leader being overly involved and or stepping back. It's these micro shifts, because if you go too far to one side or too far to the other, you'll fall over. So the tightrope walker is kind of micro shifting between left and right to go forward. They're not overemphasizing the left or overemphasizing the right. And that's the idea is that you're still making some choices between do I insert myself as the leader or do I hold back? But you're constantly going back and forth in these micro shifting ways. We talk about it as being consistently inconsistent rather than overemphasizing one or the other. Mm, I love the tightrope walker and also being consistently inconsistent. Definitely some of my takeaways from our conversation, Wendy. Thank you so much for this. I think it's time for us to shift gears now and move to the rapid fire questions. Uh, You've done this already, so you know how it works. I have five questions for you. I'll ask them in rapid succession. And the idea is that you will try to answer all five in under two minutes. And the first question is, at Culture Brain, we're on a mission to make work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. And my question to you is, what would be your number one tip to strengthen one or all three of these foundations for a healthy culture? I love these three foundations. There's probably so much to say about each of them. One thing that I have been thinking a lot about recently is belonging and the paradoxes of belonging and the importance in which somebody once used the term that you need to both bond and bridge to belong. And bonding is about finding other people that are similar to you, that enable you to connect deeply. And bridging is about making the connections across people that are different. And in organizations, that looks like 
creating this space for people to find their people that they're similar to in service of to enable the possibility of creating the space for people to connect across differences. Love it. What are the signs that a company culture needs some work or perhaps a major overhaul? I think that it's when you have people who are disengaged. And I think that a culture works when people can engage with the culture. Lately, we've seen so much disengagement as a result of work from home and virtual work. I think that we need to figure out the new hybrid way of working without people feeling totally disenfranchised from their organizations. Yeah, so true. Are there any companies that you admire for their culture? I do. There's there's so many. I mean, I, I spoke about Paul Pullman at Unilever in our last conversation. I have recently uh, studied Zita Cobb, who created the organization Shorefast in Newfoundland and the Fogo Island Inn. And I recommend people take a look at what she's done there. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful organization. I love, and I know you had on your show, the woman who created the Netflix. Patty McCord. Yeah. HR documents. And I think that's incredibly profound. I, I think there are just a number of great companies that we can emulate out there. What are your new books on cultural leadership or anything else really that you would recommend to our listeners if they want to get some inspiration around how to create a kind of workplace where people can do their best work? There's so many. I'm a big fan of Amy Edmondson's work on teaming. I am a huge fan of my colleague Dolly Chug's work, The Person You Mean to Be and How We Can Show Up and Enable Diversity in Work. I'll promote here. I had, people should read our new book. Absolutely. 100%. I'll put that on the table too. And we're going to put <laughs> links in the show notes to all these books and of course to yours, which is absolutely wonderful. I still haven't gone through the whole book and thank you for the copy, by the way, but I'm midway. And so I think I'm confidently recommending to everyone. It's a must read. Absolutely life-changing for me. Your work has been life-changing. So I absolutely agree with you. People need to read your book. So final question in this series, uh, what is one thing that our listeners can do tomorrow to build their own culture lab and start cultivating the sort of culture that will help them and their teams to bring their vision to life? You know, in our last conversation, I emphasized and I encourage people to go back to it, this idea of the, the kinds of questions we ask inform the kinds of solutions that we come up with. We often quote Paul Watts, like, the problem is not the problem. The problem is how we frame the problem. And we still believe that's true, that if you want a culture that is a both and culture, you have to shift the questions that you ask from either or questions. Should I do this or that? to both and questions. And I still think that that is the first entree into both and thinking. Oh my gosh, now I have a follow-up question. So I'm breaking my (laughs) rule of five questions. So what would be an example of a good question in that direction? Would it be something along the lines, how do we, or what, what sort of questions would you recommend we use more? You know, one of our professional hazards in this work is that anytime we hear an either or question, it triggers us to say, how could we shift the question? And so earlier you were talking about how some of the listeners and in the culture space are asking questions about culture fit or culture add or more autonomy or more hierarchy or more stability or more change in the organization. And as soon as that or word comes out, the shift is saying, how, how is it possible to create culture fit? and culture add? How is it possible to create an organization that both enables stability, enables us to value what we have now, and to be agile, experimental, and change? What we found in our research and in the research of others is that when we ask people who come into a lab in these experiments to just, when we shift the question that we're asking them, Uh, between an or question and an and question, they're more creative in the kinds of solutions and outcomes and the possible outcome space that they think about. I think it's so incredibly powerful. And this question definitely just invites people to step into this realm of possibility, right? How how can we, or how is it possible to, I, I just love that. And it's such a wonderful example of how setting certain constraints can help our creativity. 
still working within certain boundaries, but suddenly things start opening up just by using a slightly different question. So Wendy, if our listeners want to learn more about you, about your new book, about your work, what are the best online places for them to go to? They can now look at bothandthinking.net. We have more about the book and we're going to be posting there uh, pieces that we've written and podcasts that we've been on like this. They can look at my uh, work. They can reach out to me at the University of Delaware and uh, reach out to me there as well. Fantastic. And final question, who would you recommend as a wonderful guest on the show? It's such a good question. There's so many people. I think that last time I said you should reach out to Jeremy Hockenstein. Uh, and I think and he I came did, onto yes. the show. I think you might have to think more deeply about some of the wonderful people that I have met along the way. So let me get back to you on that one because that is such a, you've had such amazing guests on this show. I mean, we're now up to a hundred and something. So let me think more deeply about who could expand that conversation because I love that question. Fantastic. Wendy, thank you so much. It was a wonderful conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. I appreciate you. I appreciate your work. I am so grateful for what it has done for me personally and also for me and my business and our team. So we are really grateful. Thank you for what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. The world needs it. And I just can't wait what's going to be new for you. Are you already thinking about a new book or a new venture or it's still early days after finalizing? We do. We both have uh, several next books in mind and are open to where this book goes. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Partially, the next books in mind are all the different places where specifically we see both and thinking that emerges. I run a women's leadership center, and I've been thinking a lot about gender and leadership and the paradoxes that emerge there. I also think that there's just some really big problems in the world. There's problems with political polarization that pulls us so deeply apart uh, and doesn't allow us to solve some of our world biggest problems like climate change. And we've been thinking a lot about how we can apply both and thinking in those big issues. So there's lots of different directions in which we think this idea is important and how we can expand our thinking about both and thinking and inform some of the challenges we face in the world. Well, I can't wait for what we can learn from you in these areas, because these are definitely topics really close to my heart and I know to a lot of our listeners' hearts. So one suggestion that I have for our listeners is also follow Wendy on LinkedIn and on Twitter, because I know that you are sharing some of your work there as well. And again, we will be posting links in the show notes. So thank you again, Wendy. And I hope to have you on the show again. I get always such a pleasure. Thank you for all the work that you are doing in the world. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast, and this is the Culture Lab team. Anis El Nabarawi, production manager. Sound producer Heather McPherson, Twisted Spur Media. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. Wendy and I hope that you got inspired by what she shared about the power of paradox and the beauty of both and thinking. And if you'd like an opportunity to interact with guests like Wendy and to hear Wendy's ideas around how to work with paradoxes people face when it comes to belonging at work, well, it might be time to consider joining the Culture Brain community. We will actually have a fireside chat with Wendy in the coming months and you will be able to pick her brain in a small, intimate session alongside peers on the same journey. What exactly is Culture Brain? It's a one-of-a-kind global community for culture leaders who look for new ways of cultivating remarkable cultures in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. If you're in charge of a culture-shaping project, and if you believe that work should be synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging, this is the place for you. So who's in the community? Well, we have a very diverse group of culture leaders from Fortune 100 to tiny startups. And what brings us together is a passion for cultivating a healthy culture. If you want to learn more about Culture Brain, type this into your browser, tinyurl.com forward slash Culture Brain, and you'll find the link in the show notes. And now, time for the preview of the upcoming episode. And our next guest is a living legend, Professor Robin Dunbar. 
Robin Dunbar is a professor of evolutionary psychology at Oxford University. He has spent most of his career trying to answer a deceptively simple question. How and why did humans evolve to be such a sociable species? He's perhaps best known for Dunbar's number, the idea that there is an upper limit to the number of meaningful social relationships we can maintain. And it's an idea which seems to hold true at work as well. And yes, even in the era of remote and hybrid work, where theoretically, at least, we can connect with anyone, anywhere, thanks to our cool technology. Here's a short preview of our conversation where Professor Dunbar talks about the characteristics of centenarian companies, ones that have thrived for more than 100 years. The successful companies, the one that survived and continuing to do well now, are characterized by being small. They often only have about 500 employees. They may have lots of kind of part-time employees, but the core of it is, is a very small organization of about 500 people. It has a family ethos to it, a, a village ethos or community ethos, as you described it. They have a very clear sense of purpose and that they're there to not just make a profit, but also to do some kind of good for society, some kind of benefit for society. But also they have a long-term vision and it's not a short-term vision driven by uh, the investors who want their money as quickly as possible. They uh, are prepared to go slowly. Thanks for tuning in and listening to this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share this episode with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. If you haven't subscribed to The Culture Lab yet, you can do it on any podcast streaming platform of your choice. If you want to receive our weekly insights on cultivating a remarkable, powerful, and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser. tinyurl.com forward slash agabayer. That's T-I-N-Y-U-R-L dot com forward slash A-G-A-B-A-J-E-R. Also, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to it. And finally, the entire Culture Lab team and our guests, we are going to continue exploring how we can make the word work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging, and how we can build remarkable cultures that scale as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. So, what do you want to hear about next? What matters to you? Email us at lindsay at agabayer.com and let us know.